Hello. We are pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you find the next hour or so useful and informative. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues that our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. First, I hope everyone can see the title slide on their computer. A full screen view may be preferred. Your selection at your computer can be done by using the menu panel in the menu on your screen. Go to view and then select full screen. We estimate that the main bulk of the Sorry. presentation will take approximately one hour. A recording of this presentation will be sent to all attendees. We welcome your questions. Please use the chat window to ask your questions. If your question was not answered or you have a question after the webinar has ended, uh, you can always submit them to us via email at questions at WLL.com. Again, if everybody can please remain muted, this webinar is being recorded. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Michael Derby is the Senior Regulatory Review Engineer and Director of ACB Europe. He has been with ACB as a TCB and notified body since November 2007. In addition to being an engineer and one of ACB's directors, Michael is also responsible for ACB's training activities, including webinars and seminar workshops. He provides worldwide services to ACB's global customers for his office in the Hampshire area of the UK. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to radio frequency requirements in the European Union, also known as RED, with Michael Derby. Hi, Michael. How are you today? Hi, Kimberly. Thank you very much. Um, now, let me see if I can share my content. And every the introduction. Okay. Can you see it okay? Yes, looks great. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's Michael Darby here, and I want to talk to you about the European Radio Directive. Uh, well, I do enjoy uh, speaking with people. I like to go to a lot of seminars and events, um, and obviously a lot of them have been this year. So uh, it's nice to be speaking with you now. I hope you're all staying healthy and happy and smiling. And uh, the fact that you're here hopefully means you've still got a job. Um, and so uh, luckily we have this technology to keep us all connected, but still able to get on with our work. And in fact, you might find that a lot of you out there today are accessing this webinar through some sort of wireless communication. Okay, so, well, why are you here? Um, maybe homeschooling had got too much for you and you just needed a break from the kids, um, but probably more likely you are in some way involved with radio equipment into the European Union. So maybe you're a manufacturer, maybe you're a test lab or a notified body um, or some other kind of compliance consultant. Some, uh, just some little facts to throw around at you. Um, Market surveillance in the EU in 2018, market surveillance focused on 5 gigahertz wireless LAN. Um, and at the end of their campaign, 85% of uh, the wireless LANs they found were non-compliant. And in 2019, the focus was on um, what they called IoT products. And, and that's kind of a product that would traditionally not be known as a wireless product that had some sort of wireless module installed into it and 72% of those were found to be non-compliant. Most of those were administrative non-compliances or, or paperwork issues, really. Um, and so you can see that even, when, even with our best efforts, there's high numbers of non-compliance. And whenever we see that happening, you know that people are going to be trying to look even more closely and tighten up the requirements as much as they can. <coughs> Here's a pretty little picture for you. Um, this graph I just captured off the internet was created in 2018. So we can see the numbers up until and including 2018 are, are real numbers. Uh, and then on where we are now at 2020, on, on upwards to 2025, 
these are projections and, and these are expectations of wireless equipment. You can see the, the white box is products which you would expect to be a wireless product anyway, like a mobile phone. And that box is growing in size, that's, that's certainly true, but the bigger growth is in the red box. Um, okay. The IoT device, they're calling it, really it's a product which historically would not have been wireless, um, but now is. Uh, and whether that's through a radio module or, or some other kind of means, it's something that traditionally wouldn't have been a wireless device, but it's becoming enabled um, okay. by the manufacturers these days. Okay, so uh, quick comment about the timing. We've only got one hour for, for this webinar. I, I regularly speak for one or two days about the Radio Equipment Directive, and so uh, one hour is obviously going to be a brief overview, but I will try and leave some time for questions. We have a lot of slides, so go for it. Hopefully I don't speak too fast. <coughs> well, what are we going to cover? Obviously the Radio Equipment Directive. I'm going to try and go for a basic overview. Uh, we'll talk about the testing requirements. What happens if you make changes to the product or the, the standard changes? Um, and uh, we will end up on my favorite topic, radio modules. Of course, we can't cover the whole topic in one hour, um, and so in general, my training tends to get focused on the things that I see other people getting wrong, um, or the, thing, the primary, primary areas where I see people making mistakes. A quick introduction of the company I work for, you probably have heard of American Certification Body, or ACB. We're a notified body and a certification body. And traditionally that was our core business, or has been our core business since we started. Uh, but we also provide other kind of compliance management, um, technical support, training, test plan solutions, global market access, things like that. We've got offices around the world and I'm in one of our UK offices. For me personally, just so that you uh, know that I at least have some experience in this, um, I began work uh, for a manufacturer back in the 1980s. Um, in fact, I was EMC testing uh, at the end of the 1980s. And then I worked for a, a radio test lab through most of the 2000s, uh, th through all of the 90s and um, halfway through the 2000s. Um, and then uh, also some industry participation. I used to go to Etsy and write some standards for them. Uh, my background is EMC and radio, by the way. Um, and nowadays my, uh, my job title is director and senior regulatory engineer, but really that means that I, I do most of the reviewing uh, for the European Union or the RED, USA, Hong Kong, um, and Canada. Uh, but as Kimberly said, also a lot of training activities. Okay, so I'm also a member of the TCB Council. You may have seen me there. I was the chairman of the board of directors for a while. Um, and I'm a regular speaker and a contributor to some of their discussion groups there. You may have also seen me at the Red CA, that's the RED Notified Body Group, um, and seen some of the documents that I'm responsible for, like TGN01 for radio modules or TGN20 for SAR testing. Uh, in case I'm not busy enough, I'm the secretary of the EMC Test Lab Association. Uh, although I'm sure they only asked me to do that because I don't actually work for a test lab. And, um, and I attend many other industry events. So we may well have met. Okay, so let's move on to the far more exciting topic of the Radio Equipment Directive, known as the RED. Now, it's not the RED Directive, it's the RED or the Radio Equipment Directive. And it covers anything that's got radio in it. So if your product has any form of radio, communication or radio determination at any frequency up to 3000 gigahertz, then you make a product that's within the scope of the RED. Um, for authorizing your product to the RED, there's really only one authorization route. It's declaration of conformity. Um, all radio equipment must have a declaration of conformity, assuming it's within the scope of the RED, there is no certification route. The manufacturer is the one who declares compliance with the RED and creates the declaration of conformity. Only the manufacturer can do that. And if somebody else rebrands a product or puts their product name on it, then legally they become the manufacturer and they put their name on the product and they sign the DOC. 
So let's move straight on to the essential technical requirements. You know, I've looked at the list of attendees here today, uh, and most of you are going to be interested in what the actual assessment process. And so I'll start talking about product safety, which is included in scope of the red. Um, and because it's included in scope of the red, therefore, the low voltage directive does not apply. But the safety assessment of a radio product is kind of equiv uh, equivalent level to the low voltage directive. The only big difference, I guess, is that the low voltage directive does have a lower voltage cutoff such that low voltage products, ironically, don't come into scope of the low voltage directive. So if you have a small battery powered radio, it does require a safety assessment under the red because all radio equipment in scope of the red requires a safety assessment. Similarly, EMC. EMC is covered, and this is emissions and immunity, and it's co covered within the scope of the red, um, and it's considered to be equivalent to the assessment that you might have seen under the EMC directive, but the EMC directive itself does not apply to radio equipment. So the radio directive covers EMC and safety assessments such that the EMC and safety directives do not apply. And then, of course, radio performance. And then this is the transmitter and receiver assessment uh, where we're interested in uh, how the transmitter performs and how the receiver performs. Now, historically, in the past, under the old R&T directive, uh, which was replaced by the RED in 2016, the main focus was on the transmitter. Some radios did have a receiver performance, but some did not. But nowadays, we have this exciting buzzwords like the Internet of Things, where our whole world is going to be connected. And you may remember that pretty red and white graph that I showed you. So we're going to have radios everywhere, but there's only a certain amount of radio spectrum. And so I have a message from somebody to say they can't hear me. I'm assuming if nobody could hear me, then Kimberly would by now. But um, uh, yes, if we um, if we assume that a radio has good receiver performance, then um, other manufacturers could reuse that channel nearby, um, and uh, or they could use adjacent channels nearby. And so there is a, a direct correlation then between good receiver performance um, and good spectrum use. If the receiver is poor, um, then you can't reuse that channel or adjacent channels. And there's also Article 3.3, and uh, I don't always include 3.3 in the presentations I do because very few people even need to think about it. Um, think of it like a um, bank of um, topics, uh, like switches that the European Commission could turn on and off. Uh, and all of the grey ones on my slide here are effectively off. Um, and then you see I've written in discussion in some of them, like radio products requiring a, a common charger or a cyber security and, and fraud, um, software uploads, things like that. These are all things that are potential requirements that the Commission could turn on. At the moment, only the access to emergency services is the only Article 3.3 um, section which is mandatory. There are some other articles which um, aren't too exciting for us in the test and certification world, but from a uh, radio manufacturer, they could be important. Article 4, for example, confirms that the combination of the radio equipment and the software it uses must comply. Article 5 talks about product registration. And what exactly is that? Well, I like to think of it as like Santa's naughty list. Um, at the moment, there's nobody on the naughty list, but um, if a certain group of products uh, continue to uh, exhibit poor market surveillance performance for example, or ended up being particularly high risk, then that type of product could be put on the naughty list and therefore require product registration. Article 10 is an important one for any manufacturer uh, because it's called the obligations of the manufacturers. So that covers labeling. Um, the requirement that the manufacturer must check their product can be used in at least one EU member state, um, what instructions must be provided, things like that. That's my scrolling. There we go. Um, Article 12, uh, obligations of importers. 
um, and Article 13, obligations of distributors. I'll come on to this a bit more later on, but you know it's important to note anybody, any manufacturer in the world can sign their declaration of conformity. So if you're a manufacturer in the USA or China or uh, Korea or, or the UK, um, you can sign your declaration of conformity, um, but uh, a, a company within the EU would be the one importing that product then. And then any other company distributing the product, they all have obligations under the scope of the red. Um, and there's plenty more uh, to read in the red. If, you're, if you've got more time off work, you can sit and read that. Okay, so let's look at the EU harmonization of frequency bands. Well, as we've really learned over the last couple of years, the European Union is not all one big country. Uh, and these CE marking directives exist as a way to facilitate trade. They're not really directives, they're trade directives. Um, but what it can mean is that you've got a harmonized trade route under the CE marking directive, but you may not have a harmonized frequency bands. You know, the frequency allocations in each country may not be the same. And this can lead to restrictions of placing the radios into service. It could be okay to put the radios into the market in Europe, but it doesn't mean that they can be used in every country. So for example, um, the frequency band, if it can't be used the same in every EU country or every EU member state, then um, it's known as a non-harmonized frequency band. If it can be used in every state, it's called a harmonized band. Similarly, if, if the product requires licensing before it can be used, then then you could sell it, but there's a restriction to using it. Some devices are for indoor use only. So for example, five gigahertz wireless LAN in some of the frequency bands can only be used indoors. All of these things are considered to be restrictions. If a radio product has no restrictions whatsoever, then it's considered a class one device. So if it uses a harmonized frequency band, doesn't require a license and it can be used anywhere, then it's a class one device. But if it has any restrictions at all, then it's a class two device. And quite simply, the, the definition of a class two device is it's not class one. Um, the radio equipment directive, as I say, it's a declaration of conformity directive. It does include radio, EMC and safety, uh, but other directives may also apply. Um, and they would also need to be listed on that declaration of conformity. So you could have other directives. The ROS, for example, could apply um, medical, machinery, toy safety. So for example, if you've got a toy, um, which is also a wireless device or a machine, which is also wireless, then you could imagine that those directives and the radio equipment directives would apply. As I've mentioned though, you wouldn't have the EMC directive and the radio directive apply. Now the DOC is dynamic to each new device um, that leaves the factory floor, if you like. Now, what does that really mean? Uh, it means there's no grandfathering. And, and one example I like to give is, let's say a company identifies that they think they're going to need 3,000 of a unit. Let's say the marketing boss says, I anticipate we're going to sell 3,000 of these. So they make the prototype, they test it, they find it passes, everybody's happy. They manufacture 1,000 of them. They put them on the shelves of the shops and people buy them. So now they're in people's homes and they're being used. So now they manufacture another 1,000 and they go onto the shelves of the shops. So right now you've got 1,000 of them are in the homes of the users. 1,000 of them are in, on the shelves of the shops in the EU. And 1,000 of them are still a bunch of components in the factory floor and not even been manufactured yet. Then the rules change or the standard changes or something changes. Now, the thousand of them who are in people's homes do not need to be recalled. The thousand of them that are in the shop shelves, if that shop is in the EU, do not need to be recalled because they're already on the market in the EU. But the thousand of them that have not been manufactured yet, they will need to meet the new standard when they leave the factory before they can be sent to the shops. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, now, you will have heard of a risk assessment, I'm sure, and everybody talks about this risk assessment as being a complicated document. Um, but also, I've, a lot of manufacturers seem to 
go through the compliance process on autopilot just like they've always done and then at the very last minute they say oh now i think i need to write a risk assessment um but that's probably not really the way it should be done my recommendation is always that it's the first document you open and the last document you close so if you have an idea for a radio and you think to yourself right i'm going to make a radio now we're going to sell it to the eu first things first let's start our risk assessment let's start our plan so you're going to look at your product and say well firstly can it be used in the eu well, hopefully yes and then you're going to say well, what is it going to do what will my product do and is it going to do more than one thing has it got multiple operations and functions and where will it be used and who's going to use it You're going to use it on their body or in a factory or in a home is there just one test standard to cover the device or are there lots of standards is there a standard for every different operation so by the time you've written all those things down you you're still in the early development stage of your product but you've already started writing your risk assessment because those are the sort of things you're going to need to think about and we're going to come back to this risk assessment later on okay so let's go for some testing so the first step apply the test standards you'll hear me using words like apply and assess and that's really because there's nothing in the red that says you have to test um, you have to meet the directive which means your product must be safe must have good emc performance and must effectively and efficiently use the radio spectrum you could justify all that through pretty writing but the reality is that the preferred and recommended and really the most common solution is to test it standards have been created by different groups like etsy and senelec and they're industry groups that write standards and then the european commission can put those standards onto a document known as the official journal or ojeu the red and if you test to a standard which is listed on that ojeu and if you pass it and you fully apply it it gives you a thing called presumption of conformity so if you can find the safety standard and the emc standard and the radio standard that cover your product and if they all happen to be listed on the official journal of harmonized standards and you fully apply them and you pass then you've got a thing called presumption of conformity and really that just means that it's the responsibility of somebody else to prove that you don't comply with the directive whereas if you haven't got presumption of conformity then you've done your testing but it's up to you to demonstrate why you think that's suitable for you to comply so you can see it gives you some legal advantage but it's not a mandatory thing it's not too big a deal if you haven't got this presumption of conformity again create a risk assessment to catch anything else which isn't covered by those standards um, maybe your device has some new function that the standards group didn't think of when they wrote their standard or maybe the standards body just haven't caught up with the latest technology yet so if your product does something or has some compliance risk or mode which isn't covered by the standard that doesn't mean you go oh great it's not in the standard apparently we don't have to do it no instead it means oh, okay well it's not covered by the standard but we still need to check it because it could make our product unsafe or subject to interference or likely to cause interference meeting the directive is the important thing when you sign your doc you're not just saying i passed some tests you're saying my product will be safe and will not cause interference and and will not stop working because of interference from other things so testing to the standards is a good start so let's look at product safety um, typical examples so i've listed a very common safety standard there en 62368 but that doesn't mean that people seem to get hooked up on this idea that all radios must be tested to 62368 or 60950 but that isn't the case really you've got to look at the whole product and say well what is my appropriate safety standard so if you're making an ITE or multimedia equipment then 62368 does make sense but if for example you're making test and measurement equipment then 61010-1 might make sense instead so for a lot of these IoT devices, there might be a product safety standard that you wouldn't necessarily associate with radio, but you would still prick, pick the correct product safety standard for your product. RF exposure, however, is really a case of um, there are lots of different standards and you want to find the one that's appropriate for you. I've listed a few examples there. 
Um, and uh, it's really a case of going through the standards and finding out which one applies for your type of device. There isn't just one big say, uh, RF exposure standard to cover all types of device. EMC performance, well, EMC emissions is often covered in the radio performance standard because if you've got a product which is purely a radio device, let's say a LTE and wireless LAN router, for example, or a Bluetooth headset, well, that will have a radio standard where you'll have a radio spurious emissions limit. And then if you can turn the radio off, it will have a standby or receiver spurious emissions limit. And therefore, the EMC emissions testing isn't really needed or definitely isn't needed because the EMC radiated emissions would have been covered in the radio performance standard. However, I've included it here because, you know, more and more we're seeing devices that have lots of different functions. And I guess the classic example is you've got a washing machine with Bluetooth in it. Well, does that, uh, when your Bluetooth switches off to enable you to wash your clothes, do you really need your washing machine on a full spin cycle to try and meet the standby spurious emissions limits of the Bluetooth standard? Probably not, in which case the manufacturer is maybe going to pick a, a product specific standard for the emissions from the, the non radio part. The directive doesn't really talk about that, and actually the standards, I, in my opinion, don't do a great job of covering that, but there's guidance available on it. So then, of course, all those EMC immunity tests that we know and love, ESD, fast transients, RF immunity, etc. So some typical examples of standards, you've got the EN301489 series of standards. Dash one is the general testing requirements, and that lists all those test cases. And then all the others, dash two, three, four, whatever, they tell you how to set up each particular radio link and how to monitor it for a pass or fail. One type of radio that doesn't have a 301489 part is uh, broadcast receivers. And so if you have a broadcast receiver, you would do the EMC immunity under 55035. But as I mentioned before, if the product itself has other functions, then you need to think about the product standard too. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you've got to do a whole new suite of um, testing. It doesn't mean you're taking your product to the lab one day to do your radio testing and the next day to do your non-radio testing, because all the test cases like ESD and immunity uh, radiated immunity, they're all the same or similar test cases. So as long as you can monitor the radio link and the other operations at the same time, then you can find that you've met both standards. It's always worth checking though, imagine a Venn diagram of the two different standards and where they overlap. For example, if the product standard has a higher severity level on the immunity, then that might mean that the environment of that product is quite harsh. And so you would test up to the higher levels but of course, being a radio product, um, the radiated immunity frequency range is going to be larger probably than the product standard. So you're going to be looking at the wider frequency band and then the higher immunity level to make sure your product really is compliant. Article 3.2, this is this effective and efficient use of radio spectrum. And this covers all the transmitter and receiver performance tests. I've listed here some common examples of some standards that you probably know and recognize. Um, a couple of others here. I put in the GPS receiver one. Uh, very often people will come to me and say, I've got this radio product. You know, it does wireless LAN and LTE, um, but nothing else. And I'll say, no other radios. They'll say, nope. And I, I'll get hold of the product and I'll realize it's got a GPS receiver. And they'll say, oh, I didn't think that counted because it's not a transmitter. It, People forget some of these things. So broadcast receivers, they're in scope now, and GPS receivers, things like that. Also, it's not just communication. It's communication and radio determination. So motion sensors, RFID, uh, anything for monitoring speed or distance, um, and wireless power transfer that can identify the load. And then this Article 3.3 that I mentioned, um, where emergency services connections. So that would apply only to a product that is, is uh, applicable to that part. So for example, avalanche beacons or marine emergency radios. Excuse me, it's the afternoon and I'm an Englishman, so I've got my little cup of tea here with me. So the modes or functions of a product may be assessed separately. You might be 
testing the Bluetooth mode one moment and then the washing machine cycle the next. But in reality, the whole device must comply and it must comply with the red. People used to say this term primary function. And, you know, well, is it a washing machine or is it a Bluetooth? But we don't really use that term anymore because every function of a product is just important as any other. You've got to know why you're testing. Um, why, why are you doing this testing? Is it because you love EMC and, or maybe your local radio lab provides the best sandwiches? Um, obviously, EMC and radio engineers are entertaining and funny people, but the reality is you're probably doing it because you want to check your product works correctly. And people get really distracted on the complexity and the excitement of the EMC test, and they're setting up the test site, and they're checking the levels are right, and the power supply and the power meter and everything. And then sometimes I think they just chuck the product on a table and say, well, the light stayed on, so it must have been okay. As the reality is that the whole point you're doing these EMC and radio tests is to check that the product um, is monitoring, is operating correctly um, and will continue to operate correctly. So think about how you're monitoring the product and how you're assessing all those different modes. It's important for the manufacturer to have a good relationship with their, um, with their test lab. And if you're just sending your product to a lab and saying, test this, um, they really should be having conversations about well, how does it operate and how, uh, what is it, what would be a pass or a fail. If you've got a product that's got multiple radios in it, there isn't actually much in the way of fun, uh, clearly defined standards for that. Now, each of the different standards covers each different radio. So if you've got wireless LAN and LTE and GPS, you'll have those three different standards, but nothing really tells you what to do with regard to all three radios operating at the same time. There are guidance documents and I encourage you to look for them or, or contact me and I, I can share them with you. But um, it's very important that you recognize that your product must continue to operate when all of those radios are functioning at the same time, if indeed that's how it would work in real life. So um, as I said, the European Commission publishes this list of acceptable standards known as harmonized standards on the official journal. And as I said, that if you comply with this standard, you get this presumption of conformity. Uh, but of course, it's not the only mandatory way to proceed. If you've used test standards that are listed on the OJ, then the manufacturer can sign their own declaration of conformity without any input from a notified body. And then the manufacturer will need to keep up with any changes to the standards, as I mentioned before with my example of 3,000 products planned, but you've only sold 2,000 of them when the standard changes. Now, one thing I really want to clarify about the harmonized standards, if the safety standard or the EMC standard is not listed on the red official journal of standards, then the manufacturer can still proceed to sign their DOC and they do not need the notified body. Notified body certificate is not mandatory just because the safety or EMC standards are not listed on the OJ. You can get a notified body certificate and it could be useful, but it's not mandatory. It's only if the radio performance standard is not listed on the official journal. That's when the notified body certificate becomes mandatory. So why would anyone use a non-harmonized standard? Well, right now, uh, probably because even since the red came in, not all of the standards are listed there. So for some radio types, you just have no choice. Um, but even when things settle down and all the standards are lifted there, uh, listed there, um, technology is always moving faster than the standards, of course. So I said before in your risk assessment, you might find cases where your product can do something that isn't covered by the standard. Uh, and you might find that therefore you've got to go and do additional testing or that you've got to state you don't meet the standard. Um, and in that case, the standard might change to allow that type of technology. Um, or um, if a standard is found to be more suitable for a device um, that has just been written um, and the manufacturer wants to use that new standard, um, then uh, that might be a reason why they'd use a non-harmonized standard. Or if there is simply no standard for their product, then don't just pick some other standard and say, well, I'll pick this other one. It's not really for my device, but I'll use it anyway. Uh, that would not be correct. You would uh, have to create your own test plan or test standard. Okay, notified body, that's me in my little suit and hat. 
Um, so testing is complete, uh, but do you need a notified body certificate? Well, certificate. I'm sure that Michael said that this is a DOC, not a certification, and, and that's true. So the notified body certificate is not a certification. It's a type examination certificate, kind of like the notified body saying, I've reviewed your product, and based on my examination, here is a certificate to say, I think your product meets the requirements of the RED. It's known as an EU tech. Um, and it's used to support the manufacturer's decision to sign their DOC. It's not a certification, although it is a certificate. Slightly confusing, I know. Um, so notified bodies, well, we're independent bodies, but we've been designated by the European Commission or through an MRA. Um, we review the technical documentation of the product and we issue the examination certificate. Back under the old RNTTE, your documentation was called a TCS and the notified body's document was called their opinion. Well, under the red, the terminology has changed and, and the, the requirements have changed slightly. So it's a technical documentation and the EU tech. So the notified body will be reviewing the final radio product and we'll need to see all the technical documentation of the product, including any radio modules that are in, put, installed. Uh, we'll need to see all the test reports and results that apply to the product. You can't just say, well, we didn't test, therefore I believe we need a notified body. So we'll go to a notified body and say, we didn't test, we've come to you instead. Because uh, they're going to say, right, well, then you've got to either provide test results or show me how you at least are as good as the test reports or even more. So you're going to need to provide test reports or results or calculations at least. Um, and you can't transfer a certificate um, from one thing and, and hope that it will apply to some other thing if it isn't listed on that certificate. And we'll go over that a bit more when we talk about radio modules. Okay, so I'm flying through this, but let's have a quick summary of the red. The process is quite simple, although I have split it over two slides, admittedly. Um, identify the product. What does it do? Okay, that's your starting point. What is my product? What is it going to do? Which are the standards that apply to my product? And once you've identified what the product is, how it works, which are the standards that apply, and you're going to go to the lab or into your own lab or wherever you want, and you're going to test it or assess it to check it meets the requirements of the standard or at least um, equivalent. Then check anything else, see if there's anything about your product that's not been covered by the standard. Label it by the CE mark, which goes on the product itself and on the packaging. Maybe you need to get the notified body certificate and then create the declaration of conformity when all aspects comply. So this is the, the role of the manufacturer here. Then maintain that technical documentation for at least 10 years after you have sold each unit. And then watch for any changes. And I'll go over the changes a bit more soon, but if any changes to your product by your own company or by suppliers of your components, any changes to the standards, any changes to the state of the art, how, how life is being lived around your products, or any changes to how you see your product being used. What exactly does that mean? Well, um, let's say you make mobile phones. So probably 20 years ago, your RF exposure test on a phone would have been next to the ear. And then maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago, you would have realized that it was next to the ear or in the pocket. Whereas nowadays, you know that it's next to the ear or in the pocket or in the hands. So similar products just being used in different ways. Um, and if anything changes, standards, products, the way your products are being moved, uh, used, then go back up to the top of that list again and start all over again. So the contents of the technical documentation. Um, pretty straightforward, really. Uh, list technical documentation like schematics, parts lists, block diagrams, uh, all of the test reports, of course, user manuals, instructions. If it's got, a, if it's a class two device, do you remember what a class two device was? That's a product that has a restriction, and if it's got a restriction, then you've got to tell people what that restriction is, and there are markings required for the packaging. External and internal photographs so that your product can be identified. A copy of your declaration of conformity. A copy of your notified body certificate, if indeed you have one. Proof that your product can be used in at least one EU member state. 
Um, and if you is a restricted device, if it is a class two device with restrictions, um, then that would be yeah, that would be listed um, in your technical documentation um, and your manufacturer's risk assessment. Some common documents that uh, I see people have mistakes with. Well, um, test reports. You do not need a accredited test lab. The lab doesn't need accreditation. It doesn't need that standard on their scope. You can do the testing yourselves if you want. But it is important to have uh, trust and faith in the test results because, of course, um, the manufacturer will be signing the Declaration of Conformity, which is a legal document based on those test results. So it's important to pick a good lab. The risk assessment, a lot of people have problems with. I've seen risk assessments um, that were half a page long, and I've seen risk assessments that were 50 pages long. I think probably the best solution lies somewhere between those two points. Um, but in, in general, it's checking that um, which standards apply. Have you got all the standards that apply, not just the first one you came to? Um, has the device been fully assessed or has it got functions that um, aren't covered by the standards? If you've got multiple transmitters, what did you do? Or multiple receivers, what did you do about that? Um, if your product is intended for some unusual environment, maybe especially hot or especially cold or for use in a vehicle, is that a consideration? If you didn't use a harmonized standard for safety or EMC um, and you proceeded without a notified body, then how, how did you justify that? User manual. The CE mark does not need to be in the user manual, but um, some technical details of the radio must be. You need to list the frequency range and the rated output power of your radio must be in the user manual. Also, if there are any accessories like antennas or software, if the user can change those things and if it could affect compliance, then the details of them must be detailed in the user manual and in fact on the declaration of conformity as well. So any safety instructions necessary, of course, would need to be in the user manual. Um, and if it's a class two device with restrictions, then that would need to explain exactly what those restrictions are. The declaration of conformity must be provided to each user, um, so it must accompany each radio. It can either be the full DOC, or you can make a DOC statement and provide a link perhaps to an online DOC. All applicable directives, if there are more than one, uh, must be on that same document, and it's created by the manufacturer, and that's the company with their name on the product. As I said before, um, any kind of accessories must be listed on the DOC, but also the manufacturer's name and address, identification of the product, a statement of declaration of compliance with the directive, um, a list of the standards used. Of course, it must be signed and dated by somebody responsible. Um, I just mentioned that the DOC must be provided with every radio. It can either be the full final DOC or it can be a compliance statement. And on the European Commission's website, they do list a document uh, which makes that uh, compliance statement in all the different European languages. So what if you're a manufacturer outside the EU? Let's say you're based in the USA or China or Taiwan or Japan. Um, or maybe in the future, after January 2021, we don't know the transition period, we don't know the deal um, with the UK, but um, let's say for argument's sake, the UK does not get a deal uh, with the EU, then the UK will clearly just be a, yet another non-EU country. Well, the manufacturer would still sign the EU, uh, the DOC, and therefore, the importer takes legal responsibility for the product that they import and they place on the market. Uh, the red does state that the importer should check the compliance of the product if they have any concerns about it. And the importer must add their contact details to the packaging. The manufacturer remains responsible and the importer becomes responsible as well, not instead. And dis uh, distributors are also responsible for compliance. Um, a couple of links here to some useful documents. We've got the EU Blue Guide, um, blue as in the colour, uh, and this covers all CE marking issues uh, and all kind of placing on the market issues. Um, whereas then you have the Red Guide for the Radio Equipment Directive, 
Um, and that, that covers anything specific to radios. So, for example, if you wanted to find out about uh, radio modules uh, into vehicles, for example, you would look into the red guide. If you wanted to look about what happens if I take a product that's broken, bring it back to my factory, mend it, and then give it back to the customer, have I placed that back on the market or not? The answer is you haven't. It was already on the market. Um, then that would be in the blue guide because that's a, a higher level topic that is covered by all the directors. Okay, market surveillance. Everybody, you know, you know, you want to know what to do, but everybody also wants to know about market surveillance. So market surveillance is handled by every European country or every member state, and then it's coordinated by a higher level group called ADCO, and that stands for Administrative Cooperation. And there's an ADCO group for each directive, so there's an ADCO Red. Some of the European countries are a little more proactive than others, and some tend to react based on complaints, but every EU country must do market surveillance and they must supply their results to the European Commission at the end of the year. Some of them the countries, of course, have got a lot of money and test labs, and so they're more likely to perform testing. Um, I think France, for example, does a lot of SAR testing. Other EU countries maybe haven't got so much money, maybe haven't got access to test labs, so they're more likely to check paperwork. Is the DOC correct? Is the labeling correct? Things like that. In fact, if market surveillance, it's, it's clearly written in the red, that if the market surveillance authority finds an admin non-compliance with the product, then they can make the manufacturer pay for the testing. Market surveillance in the EU is typically done from take, taking products from the market, and so the manufacturer might not even know it's done. Um, at our last meeting with market surveillance, ADCO, um, they did comment that one of the biggest problems they're seeing is just people failing to correctly label their product, so you don't know who's, who uh, is the manufacturer. Okay, making changes to a product, just when you've got it all done and finished and you want to relax, somebody changes the product. So if there's a change to the product, um, you've got to review what you've done, review what testing you've done, and see which tests could be affected by your change. Um, mostly it's going to be a, a retest, for example. If you've changed a hardware thing, then you're probably going to end up doing some sort of um, retesting. Um, what might have triggered a change? Well, um, in a standard, um, I mentioned before that uh, when a harmonized standard changes or, or when a test standard changes, you need to reassess to the new standard. Often, the, the change to the standard is triggered by manufacturers. Most changes to the standards come from the manufacturer wanting to um, change their product, or this expression state of the art, which is kind of a strange term, but it, it kind of means that, you know, the way things are being done. So how your product is being used, that comes under state of the art. Uh, I guess you could say the fact that one year ago, most of us were working in offices using all of our office IT home um, conferencing systems, and now we're working in our homes using probably the same conferencing system. So the way in which products are being used has changed because of the way the lifestyle uh, has changed around us. When new standards appear, if a standard is listed in the official journal, you usually get about an 18-month transition period. If a standard changes, it doesn't mean you need to fully retest everything. You don't need to go and get a nice, pretty new test report, unless there's some other country that's asking you for it. But for the EU, so let's say, for example, this very common standard, EN 300-328, that covers wireless LAN and Bluetooth and Zigbee. Just recently, well, I say recently, actually, more than six months ago, um, version 2.2.2 got listed on the official journal. And the old version 2.1.1 will be removed from the official journal on the 6th of August 2021. So if you want to keep selling Bluetooth, wireless LAN, Zigbee devices, you need to make sure you meet that new standard. Now, if you've tested to the old one, you're going to need to upgrade to the new one. And the receiver blocking test has changed. So therefore, you're going to need to perform a new receiver blocking test. The spurious emissions limit has changed but actually it's become more relaxed. So that's changed, but you're probably not going to need to retest it. 
there are some text changes and, and sort of admin changes, but again, it might not be a big deal to you. So it doesn't mean you need to go back to the lab and say, I need full EN 300.328 version 2.2.2 testing. Instead, you could probably go back and say, please just do the receiver blocking test. And then based on your old test report and then your new additional receiver blocking test, you can demonstrate and you've got evidence for compliance with version 2.2.2. And you don't need a notified body because you've got that evidence. What if I did have a notified body certificate and you change your product? Well, then the notified body certificate becomes invalid because you've made a change and you haven't told the notified body about it. So contact the notified body and figure out between you if you need an update to the certificate or not. Similarly, if the standard has changed, the notified body certificate doesn't cover that new standard because the notified body didn't review the product to that new standard. So if you want a new notified body certificate, you need to go back to the notified body uh, and discuss that with them. Okay, my favorite topic, radio modules. So um, as we probably know, um, it's a wireless world. You know, a few years ago when I first started radio testing, I knew who the radio engineers were. They would come in and they'd say, I've built a radio and I know exactly how it works and I'd like you to test and certify that radio. Whereas nowadays, you have people who say, I make a product and I've learned it needs to be wirelessly connected. Uh, and so I've bought a radio module because now we have this industry where some people make radios and some people make the products and then put the radios into their products. So I'm going to talk about what is a CE marked radio module? What exactly does it mean to have a CE marked radio module? Um, and secondly, um, what do I do if I'm installing such a module into my product or if I'm a test lab um, and somebody's got such a product? Well, as a quick reminder, the radio equipment directive, if you want to CE mark a radio, you need to think about product safety, RF exposure, EMC emissions and immunity, transmitter performance and receiver performance. Okay, so modular approvals in the EU, simply put, there's no such thing. A radio module is basically just radio equipment. If you want to put a radio module on the market so that anybody can buy it, then it must meet the requirements of the, of the RED. This is if it's within scope of the RED, of course. I mean, if, if all of the radio technology is on the module and the company wants to put it on the market as a, as a radio, then it needs to be CE marked to the RED. Even if it's sold business to business, it's considered being placed on the market. So when a module is CE marked, it's basically CE marked as a type of radio equipment. The module manufacturer has been responsible for the compliance of that module as a radio device. There's no unique rules to assess a module. You may know if you've done any FCC testing where there's FCC certification, if you certify a radio, then you install that radio into something else, then the certification is lost. But if you certify for the FCC a radio module as a modular approval, it gives it kind of superpowers that the certification remains valid when it's installed. Well, in the EU, we don't have such um, certification. It's all DOC on the final radio. So if you install any radio inside another and you, you've kind of lost the module and created a new thing, then you have a new uh, radio product. So how would a radio module manufacturer assess it? Well, radio performance testing should be pretty simple. Um, the module's probably got an antenna or an antenna port, so that's pretty simple. EMC, probably minimal amounts of EMC testing was done and RF exposure and safety um, will have been assessed of the radio module. But the EMC and RF exposure, you know, they're really quite unique. Um, sorry, product safety and EMC, um, there are pretty unique to the installation. Now, when a module manufacturer assesses their module, they're supposed to assess it for the intended environment. Um, excuse me. Uh, but of course, the module manufacturer isn't going to know the intended environment. So most likely they will have assessed it for use on a test jig, for example, or at the end of a cable. So now if you're installing that radio module into a new product, um, the CE mark isn't transferable. It's, you've probably all heard the expression CE plus CE does not equal CE, um, unless, of course, the module was assessed for that use. 
So the module become if the module is permanently installed inside the product when that product is placed or before that product is placed on the market, then the CE mark of the module is effectively lost and a new product is made. This doesn't mean that the CE mark on the module is worthless or useless. The CE mark on a module is an excellent thing and it, it shows you that that module is a good product um, and it can comply, but it also, of course, allows the module manufacturer to place the module on the market in the first place. So the manufacturer of the final product becomes a new radio product manufacturer and they must fully assess their product to the red, which is just the same as it was under the RNTTE directive. By the way, I should add, if the final product that the module goes into is a vehicle or a fixed installation, then that doesn't become radio. You don't CE mark your house or, or your car to the red. Um, in those cases, the module or the radio remain separately accessible. So for the installer, product safety, they're going to do product safety on that final product, of course, and there's really nothing to be carried over from the module to the final product, except maybe the RF exposure if it was based on a calculation. If it's a SAR test for a portable device, then that will always be done on the final installation. EMC. EMC testing of a radio module is really very unlikely to bear any resemblance to the EMC testing of the final product. So when you're testing the EMC of that final product and you're assessing the operation of the final product and the radio link, um, it's really not relevant to consider any of the EMC results from the module. Radio, however, that's where you can save some time if you've installed a module, if the module manufacturer will give you their test reports, because a lot of the conducted antenna port measurements, let's say uh, duty cycle, bandwidth, timing of a signal, things like that, they're not going to change just because you've installed a module in your host. So as long as you've got the results, then there's no need for you to repeat those tests. Probably most installers are going to repeat just the tests that could be affected by the installation. So transmitter spurious emissions, maybe the radiated power, maybe the receiver performance because your host product could be changing the receiver performance of the module. The installer's technical documentation. Well, if the installer wants to have this presumption of conformity, then they need to have evidence that their product meets the harmonized standard. Um, and they need that evidence or the test results. Otherwise, they're not going to have that presumption of conformity. Uh, a lack of full data or evidence to that latest standard um, obviously could mean a trip to a notified body, but um, any kind of acceptance of test data from a module manufacturer into the host product is obviously going to be a pretty big part of the manufacturer's risk assessment, and that's the installer's risk assessment. Uh, and there is a pretty clear guidance on this called TGN01. Um, as I said, for Article 3.2, radio performance, if the installer doesn't have evidence of the compliance with the harmonized standard, then you're going to need to go to a notified body and explain how you meet that standard. Um, and so um, a notified body, you know, we do a lot of that sort of work. Any acceptance of test data from the module is at the decision of the installer, of course. This isn't like you can't find a document that says you're allowed to accept results from the module. It's all down to the installer's risk and uh, own individual assessment. Um, and of course, the, the final product manufacturer is the one signing the DOC for that final product. The final product must be assessed to the latest requirements of the RED. So let's say you've bought a load of radio modules that were compliant with the old version 2.1.1 of the RED and you've installed them all. Well, when you're doing your checks on your final product, remember you're going to need to do a receiver blocking test to get your Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever uh, compliant with the latest version of the standard because you're now a radio manufacturer. Um, Non-compliant radio modules placed on the market, of course, market surveillance would go after the module manufacturer, but for the final product placed on the market, non-market surveillance is going to go for the manufacturer of the final product. Okay, so I, I apologize, I've rushed a little bit at the end there. Um, Time to close that final document. I said that the risk assessment was the first document you open when you first start planning your product. And so now you've, you've 
planned your product, you've checked it meets the red requirements, it's in one of the harmonized bands, or at least it can be used in at least one country, you've fully tested it to all the standards that apply, you, maybe you have a notified body certificate, you've signed your DOC, and then you're constantly watching to see if your product changes or the way your product is used changes. And then you sit back, sell some products, make some money, um, have fun, relax, um, try not to get isolated in global apocalyptic pandemics and uh, until somebody says that they've got a plan for a new product. So uh, your next step, um, contact us if you have any requirement for a red notified body review, of course. Uh, contact us if you want help planning or if you have installed multiple modules and you want us to check what you've done um, or if you need any training or if you just want to say hello and keep in touch. So uh, there, uh, that's my quick whirlwind tour of the red. Um, I think if I stop sharing, uh, oh, I'm still sharing. Kimberly, I don't know if you wanted to. No, that's fine. You can leave it there. That way they have your information. Oh, thank, thank you. you all for your patience. Uh, yep. and, uh, thank you, Michael. I did see a couple of questions coming in. Do you mind answering a few? I'll do my best, yes. All right, uh, let's see. Um, first question I see is, if there is an update on a standard and I yep. check the differences, should I note this in the risk assessment to show that I'm still compliant? Of course, I want to update the DOC to the latest versions of the standard. But anyhow, I think I can, I have to declare why I apply to the later standard. Is that risk assessment the correct location? Yeah, I would say so. So um, back in the olden days, people used to talk about the, the technical um, construction file or TCF. They used to talk about it like a final document where you'd, where you'd note stuff down. Nowadays, I think the risk assessment is a good place. So let's say you're using version one of a standard, you've tested to it, you've passed, you're selling your product, and then version two comes out and you read version two and there's no test changes for you. Maybe some text changes or they've, they've added a new allowance, but it doesn't affect you. So you can write the new standard version on your DOC, but you need a paper trail really in case anybody asks. So for me, yeah, if I was a manufacturer, I would go to my risk assessment and I'd say, hey, add addition on this date, um, this new standard came out, we did a check, none of the tests ne need repeating for us, therefore we've written the new version on our DOC and that's where I would keep it because if market surveillance come to you and say, why have you done this, um, you can just throw your technical documentation at them and, and including the risk assessment and they should see all the answers. I guess you've got to think, if you if you make that change and then you leave the job or you go on holiday, your um, the person who follows you needs to needs to know why you justified writing a new standard on your DOC. So yeah, I would write that in my risk assessment. All right, thank you for that. Um, next question I see for wireless power transfer products without modulation of the carrier, can the EMC directive be used for the power transfer functions? and the red for radio related function, functions, such as position determination, Wi-Fi communication, et cetera? Okay, good question. So um, if you've got a device that is just a CW wireless power transfer and it doesn't have any form of radio in it, then the EMC directive and the low voltage directive applies. But if you've got a wireless power transfer that is just CW signal, so it's an, what we would call an ISM device, but there's also a radio in it, that, let's say maybe Bluetooth low energy or maybe some other communication handshaking thing, then the whole product is in the scope of the red, not the EMC directives. The whole product comes in the scope of the red and that CW wireless power transfer signal would be assessed under articles 3.1a and 3.1b. There wouldn't really be an Article 3.2 radio assessment of it because it's not a radio communication signal. So the whole product would be in the scope of the red. Hopefully that answers that. All right, there's a, quite a few questions. I'm going to probably read one or two more. Um, let's see. If I am using a module which was tested for the new receiver blocking requirements by using a conducted sample, is it then okay to reuse this report as I'm placing that product on the market 
having a connector on it, but a product with an integrated antenna. So how to handle that? Or so how to handle that doing a radiated test for blocking? Yeah, it's a it's a typical one. It's really not that simple. I think a lot of manufacturers probably just look at a radio module and think, oh, it's tested everything. I'll install it. I, I can relax. Maybe I'll check the transmitter spurious emissions. Um, but in reality, the receiver performance could have changed. So I think everybody's going to need to have to look at this in, in detail. And I think a lot of people don't. Um, so let's say, for example, you've got a module um, with an antenna connector and receiver blocking was performed. And then suddenly you're putting an antenna. Hi, Rachel, it's Dan. Uh, suddenly you're putting a antenna on that product and then you bury that deep inside um, the host, if you like, or the, the other product. You really could have affected the receiver performance. So it would be wrong of me to sit here and say you must always test receiver blocking or receiver performance because if your product is a plastic enclosure and your antenna is right on the edge and it isn't shielded and and there's nothing blocking it, then you might conclude that actually your receiver performance is fine and doesn't need checking. Um, but you might look at it. So I would say it's on a case by case basis. You can't assume it will uh, will comply. I think the, the key point is people get stuck in this idea that if you install a module, you can just check spurious emissions and then relax. But that's not written anywhere. The, the, the real answer is, you've got to check anything which could be at risk of not passing. And so that could be a receiver, depending on the installation and the what it's next to and what the case is made of and all those things. Cool. All right, thank you. I'm going to read one last question. Um, I have time, by the way, if you want more questions. But it's up to you. I have time, too. It's early or not in, so all right. I can continue to tell me not to if you like. Yep. I'm absolutely. sure they would like that. Sure, yeah. Let's keep going until uh, in, until everybody falls asleep. <laughs> well, I'm up over here. So don't worry. All right, next question. In your example of the 1,000 parts sitting on the shelf but not shipped and a standard mm -hmm. changes, does it matter if the product is sitting in a non-EU warehouse versus an EU warehouse? If it yes. is in a non-EU warehouse, would it be required to meet the new standard? Yeah, good point. Um, it's does matter. So on the market in the EU is the important thing. So if it's in the warehouse or on the shelves of a shop or or whatever, um, so you know a factory that's in the EU kind of has a lucky advantage because they can literally make it at one end of the room and then call the other end of the room the warehouse and then they go, hey, look, I've I've picked up the product, I've run to the other end of the room and it's in our warehouse, it's in the EU. So that's on the market. But if you're outside the EU, it's got to be placed on the market in the EU. Um, and so, yeah, if it was in a, a warehouse, I mean, I guess if you're advertising it for sale, um, then it, it's still got to come through customs. It's still got to enter the EU and somebody's still got to import it. So, yeah, on the shelves or in the warehouse, I, I'm really talking about it being in the EU. Thanks. Okay. Next question. What would be the effect of BREX, did I pronounce that right? Brexit. Oh, Brexit, thank you. Okay, Has no, on sorry. implementing red in EU market. Will UK adopt similar requirements, only get UK base and a notified body to issue approval? Okay, cool. So the easy and honest answer is nobody knows yet. Um, so we can all guess. So the UK left the EU in January 2020 with a one-year transition period until January 2021. There is always the possibility that the UK will form a, um, a deal with the EU such that CE marking is allowed and everybody's happy um, and nothing changes. But the sort of indication we've received is that the UK government isn't going to want to do a deal. They want to be completely separate. Um, and in which case, then not allowed to copy CE marking as their sort of logo, if you like. They could choose to have the same assessment requirements, same standards and things, um, but they can't copy CE marking. And they proposed the uh, kind of UKCA mark. So um, 
we expect that the UK will adopt similar requirements, such as like testing requirements. Um, but for example, if you've already had a notified body certificate, and if your notified body is in the UK, then that certificate will become invalid or has become invalid. Um, and so um, it all kind of depends on what kind of deal the UK gets with the EU. Um, but we expect there'll be a similar testing requirement, but probably a different labeling requirement. All right, next question. So there is no notion of modular approval, but there is the idea of combined equipment such as yep. published in the EN 303446-X, but these yes. are not yet in the OJEU. What is the yeah. status of these developments? Yeah, sure. So um, there's no standards for combining equipment, and, and a great example of combining equipment is putting a module into something. Um, and there are these two standards, EN 303446-1 and 446-2. And they are talking about EMC testing, for example, um, when you combine products together, like putting a module into something. The original idea was that those standards might um, appear on the official journal so that a manufacturer could follow them and then say, look, I did the right thing. But in reality, I think they're really good standards, but they just don't provide enough legal certainty for the lawyers at the, at the European Commission to ever accept them. So I don't think they'll ever be listed on the official journal. Um, and therefore, I think they remain pretty good guidance. Now, luckily, they cover EMC, which, of course, you don't need a notified body for, and a manufacturer can make their own decision. So I still think they're pretty good guidance, um, but I don't think they'll provide presumption of conformity because I don't think the European Commission's consultant will consider them to have enough legal certainty. Okay, there's a lot of people saying thank you for this interesting webinar and presentation and did a great job. Um, the next question we do have, um, I believe you answered, but I'll read it just to make sure. Again, on last 1,000 units, how about the transition period may apply? That was answered, correct? Um, I wonder if they're talking about um, so transition period. Are they talking about the UK and the EU? Don't know. Again, on the last thousand units, how about the transition period? Matter? So right now, if, if they're talking about the UK leaving the EU, right now we're in a transition period whereby um, the UK is effectively still in the EU. If they're talking about transition period of standards changing, then yes, whilst both standards are listed on the official journal, you can still have those thousand units anywhere you like. It's only when the the old standard falls off the official journal and just leaving the new one um, from that day on, then any unit not on the market in the EU has to meet that new standard. I hope I explained that well. All right. Um, which, are referen which are reference EMC safety standards to be referred for wireless mobile charger approval? So wireless mobile charger. Okay, so wireless power transfer. Um, oh gosh, I don't know off the top of my head. There's, um, I've got a standard name in my head, and I, uh, I keep wanting to say EN three zero three four one seven, but I, that could be wrong. That could be me just plucking a name out of nowhere. Um, I would have to go and check. I think, um, yeah, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the. Um, oh, and, and by the way, and that's radio. So yeah, what EMC and safety for wireless chargers? Well, um, I guess it depends what kind of uh, charger and whether it's CW or radio. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm going to probably just take the cowardly easy answer and say I, I don't know without looking it up, I'm afraid. Okay, I am copying these questions in the name, so I might can get that one to you. You can respond to them, and I'll provide you the email later if you like. Cool, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Um, the next question, what is the future of receiver testing? In the standardization, WGS, is the coexisting testing taking the spotlight over blocking test? test? Okay, so yeah, what's the future of receiver testing? In the work standardization working groups, is the coexistence testing taking the spotlight over blocking tests? 
Uh, that's a good question. Um, I've actually just started working on a um, on a standard um, Etsy standard, so I probably be able to answer that at some point in the future. They seem very interested in this receiver blocking um, test, um, and, and it, it seems like somebody has uh, has obviously decided that receiver blocking is is the good thing. Um, and, and I guess coexistence is really dealing with other radios nearby. Um, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it's, I, I would say that blocking deals with coexistence. Um, I would, I'm often surprised that the, these standards have blocking, but they don't always have a basic receiver performance test. So you could have mediocre receiver performance and then maybe just continue to be mediocre when there's other standards nearby, other radios nearby. I guess the, um, I don't think it's changing, I guess, is my easy answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, next question. Is the DOC one of the documents that must be submitted to the notified body when a TEC is required? Okay. If the guide, the guide is referenced in 300-328, is it necessary to obtain notified body assessment? So if you've got a combined equipment and your final product meets EN 300-328, um, that's the harmonized standard, then you don't need a notified body. But if you don't have evidence of compliance with the latest version of 300-328, then you do need a notified body. So <clears throat> I think EG or Etsy Guide 203-367 is referenced um, in um, under 328, but it's more of a kind of, hey, go and look at this guidance, it might help you. It, it doesn't, it, EG 203.367 isn't a harmonized standard, and, and so um, I think it's just like a an informative reference within 300.328. So you'd still need evidence of compliance to 300.328 if you want to avoid using a notified body. Okay. All right. Someone said, uh, excellent presentation for EMC, where a standard requires standby mode be tested. Would you consider a two-way communication with heavy traffic load sufficient to show that as long as the signal doesn't drop, it would be acceptable to show no unintended signals occurred? Because if they did occur, the packet loss would increase or the link would drop. Or do you feel a separate test with the EUT in standby being monitored for unattended transmissions? Yeah, I, I would say it really depends on the radio link type um, because, you know, we could be talking about short burst RFID. We could be talking about LTE with um, fast data traffic. I, I think I understand what they're saying. Um, and obviously, each manufacturer can make their own decision on that. But in reality, the... EN301489 standard is going to tell you how to set up the radio link and how to monitor the radio link in the communication mode. Um, and then also, again, with that communication off or the transmitter off um, to check that it doesn't unintentionally transmit. And I think the unintentional transmit thing, again, it could depend on, on what kind of product you've got. You know, if you've got like a mobile phone, um, it's not going to accidentally establish a call with a um, with a base station, um, but the screen might fail such that the screen thinks you've pressed make a call. So the radio communication part probably isn't going to suddenly link to a licensed base station just because you hit it with the SD, but the screen might fail such that it thinks you've tried to make a call. Um, and so you're testing the phone then rather than the radio link, if that makes sense. And, and so you could argue, well, the phone passes because the screen doesn't do that. And so I don't necessarily need to test all these bands, for example. But then if you've got something like a little monitor that maybe somebody with health issues wears, um, such that they would press it and it would call the ambulance, um, if you have something that every time they shuffle across a carpet and touch the kitchen table, an ambulance arrives, you know, that's suddenly a much more critical um, unintentional transmission. So um, I would say it kind of depends on what radio it is and the use case depends on how 
how how much you can bend the rules by. Does that make sense? All right. I see two more questions, and I'm probably gonna wrap it on up from here. Yeah. Um, can we do limited testing on the host product if the radio modules are tested to red directive? So all radio modules placed on the market should be assessed to the radio equipment directive. Um, and if they have been assessed to the radio equipment directive, then um, then that's great. And they will be CE marked. And they will have been CE marked for however they were tested. So most likely they're CE marked for uh, SJIG, for example. Um, and when you install that module, however close your installation is to the to the conditions on which the module manufacturer assessed it, then that kind of tells you um, um, what we do. If your product is like a Raspberry Pi or something like that, sorry to name drop somebody's product, but if your product is like a board and you take a module that was tested on a board and you put the module on your product, which is a board, then actually your installation of that module is probably very similar to the assessment by the module manufacturer. But if you take the module and you suddenly put it inside a metal enclosure where there's four or five other radios right next to it and a, a noisy electronics as well, then suddenly your environment for your radio is very different. And so your level of limited test, yes, you can do limited testing, but if, if you're looking for an answer of how much limited testing, it really comes down to, well, what is your radio and where have you installed it and how much did it pass by? By the way, I, I do a lot of work where people install radio modules and they come to me and say, how much testing must I do? Uh, and one of my, the important things I ended up looking at is, well, how much did the module pass by when it was on its own? Um, so all of those things are, are important. All right, uh, last question from what I can see and it's, EN305550 has yeah. been in draft mode for many years. Any yeah. reason why this is not finalized being a draft we need for Notify Body Cert? Yeah, so I don't, I, I'm not on that committee, so I don't know um, exactly what's holding up. The last time I spoke to Etsy about, so for everybody's information, EN305550 is basically the short range device standard for 40 gigahertz to 260 gigahertz. EN300-330, then EN300-220, then EN300-440, then EN305-550. And the last time I spoke to Etsy, they said basically not enough people are turning up to contribute to the standard. There's just not enough people interested. Um, you know, Etsy isn't like a government organization. They don't have engineers sitting around strumming their fingers waiting to write standards they're basically empty rooms and people from industry or manufacturing turn up to write a standard when they want a standard um, so if anyone makes a short range device for the frequency band 40 gigahertz to 260 gigahertz the best thing they can do is join etsy sign up for the 305550 working group and help to get it completed um, and apparently there's just not enough people doing that. All right. Well, thank you so much. What I did see a lot of is a lot of people saying thank you for a great presentation. I couldn't agree more, Michael. This was very, very interesting. So our thanks goes out to Michael Derby for taking time out to enlighten us about radio frequency requirements in the European Union, also read. Our next upcoming webinar is covering radio frequency exposure requirements for wireless applications on August 20th. If you haven't already done so, please make sure you visit our website to register for this webinar if you are interested and to also see a list of other upcoming free webinars. On behalf of Washington Laboratories, I would like to thank you all for attending and I'm going to go ahead and end the event. Please enjoy your day and please stay safe, most important. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.